Hi, I'm back. Did you miss me? In the mo Hi, I'm back. What's good, y'all? Welcome back. Welcome back to another F1 video for today. Man, happy Thanksgiving to y'all who, who want to celebrate tomorrow. Um, so I want to give you guys a video before tomorrow, man. Keep you guys engaged. Uh, good. Shout out to man John Warren, as always, man. Dropping bangers. We're going to check out Kobayashi. Uh, he did get podium 2012 at Japan, so we did go over, if you guys have not seen my 2012, I think, recap, it's in the, uh, it's in the channel, I'll probably link it down in the description as well, but it's like a pretty long video, you guys very enjoy it as well, man, we are going to be back with the, uh, with the yearly season reviews, I think next, I think we got 2016, so, the year Nick Nico Rosberg won for Mercedes, so we are going to check that out, looking forward to doing that one as well, and, uh, ah, ah, my pinky, Ah, ah. Anyway, let's go and check out how good was Kobayashi. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gonna say it first thing. I, I don't know how to, how to say it, but anyway, let's get started. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe if you are new to the channel. Let's get started, man. Did you miss me? In the months I haven't uploaded to this channel, I've been a bit busy, but I've still had more than enough free time to watch an average lifetime's worth of YouTube. In the time I've spent scrolling through my recommended page, I keep seeing videos about a certain F1 driver by the name of Kamui Kobayashi. Kamui. Now, being the selfish person that I am, I saw these videos were getting a lot of views, and naturally, I've decided that the best thing for me to do now is to make a video on Kobayashi to try and make some sweet cash on the subject. <laughs> and, That's to be right. honest, the more I looked into him, the more I found to talk about, so we can easily get to the 8-minute mark on this one. <laughs> Kamui Kobayashi wasn't all that great of a driver, and I didn't think I was alone in that, but having actually looked through his career results and stuff, I thought he was pretty underrated. In fact, given the right machinery, he could easily of challenge for wins. So, how good was Kamui Kobayashi? There's only one way to find out. Kamui Kobayashi was born in the Japanese city of Amagasaki to the owner of a sushi restaurant. Realistically, nobody watching this video is here for the life story, so let's fast forward a few years to the start of his racing career. He began, like most I'm other interested. drivers, in karts, where he won four titles in seven years from the age of nine. In Jeez. 2001, he was awarded a scholarship from the Toyota Racing School thanks to his success in karting. This led to his first season in the Formula Toyota Series in 2003, where he finished second. So, it's a quick little thought, like we have seen with other F1 drivers as well, having great success at an early career. He won, what, four and seven? By the age of nine. Uh, also, I did see Daniel Rick is going to be a third driver back with Red Bull. Um, happy with Daniel Rick still in F1. He's going to be a third driver. So, uh, it's good to see Danny, you know, staying. And back with Red Bull as well. So, also, you, let, you guys let me know in the comments down below. Do you think Danny Rick should have never left Red Bull? Let me know with two wins out of the 10 races. So, as starts to racing careers go, this was a very good one. In 2002, Kamui moved to Europe and began competing in three Formula Renault championships. He came seventh in the Italian series and competed in the German and Netherlands series as a guest, finishing 31st and 15th. Now, these don't sound like good results, but bear in mind that he only did a few races in the German and Netherlands series, so we can't have expected him to score enough points for top 10 in the championship. Anyway, fast forward to 2005, and in this year, he won two titles, the Formula Renault Euro Cup and the Italian Formula Renault Series. Oh, he's solid. Now, the impressive thing about the Italian series <laughs> is that Kobayashi missed two rounds and still took the championship, so this wasn't a bad year at all. He then moved on to Formula 3 the following year, finishing 8th in the Euro Series, 19th in the one-off Macau Grand Prix, and 11th in the other one-off Masters of Formula 3. He came back to all three of these events the following year, with 4th in the Euro Series and 13th in Macau. He retired on the first lap of the Masters of Formula 3, but hey, it was a good year nonetheless. Also in 2007, Kobayashi was signed as the third driver for the Toyota team in Formula 1. In 2008, he moved on to GP2, finishing 6th in the Asia Series and 16th in the World 1. Mm. Now, this was with a Dams team that was struggling a bit, so again, not too bad. In 2009, he again came 16th in GP2, but over the offseason, he won the GP2 Asia Series. And finally, at the end of 2009, he was signed by the Toyota team for the last two races in the season, hey. where he finished in the top 10 for both races, hey. including scoring points in the last race of the season. Now, what Toyota saw in Kobayashi's two 16th place finishes in GP2, I will never know, but when Glock was injured in a crash in the previous race's qualifying session, they had no choice but to run Kamui. Now, we can't fault the fact that he scored points in his two races. All right, can't be mad about in that. In fact, despite being in his first two F1 races, he beat his teammate Yano Trulli in both of them. 
that's not just not bad. That's, that's good. Decent, that's good. Me. And to make this debut more of course, special, Kobayashi one. from Japan had scored points for a Japanese team in their last ever race in Formula 1. However, this was a bit bittersweet, as it meant that despite the strong start, Kobayashi didn't have anywhere to race the following season. Oh. Yet. Sauber, who had just been dumped by BMW, were in need of a second driver, and having seen Kobayashi's 2009 race, he decided in. to put him alongside Pedro de la Rosa for 2010. Now, his first full season didn't exactly get off to a splendid start. After his engine blew up in Bahrain, his front wing came off on the first lap of the race in Australia, causing him to T-bone Nico Hulkenberg who you should definitely go and watch my video on, by the way. Round 3 in Malaysia brought another engine failure, and then oh, in China, geez. Kobayashi nailed the race star, only to find Vitantonio Liuzzi go backwards over his car into Turn 6. With four retirements from four races, none of them through his own fault, this has to be up there with one of the unluckiest starts to a Dang, season. Dang, my guy, get up! However, things would take a brighter turn down the line. Just, not yet. After crossing the- So he has some pretty- Not great success early on in F1, obviously a lot of car issues crashing in Malaysia. China, um, but still, still enough for one. Uh, I don't think that team wasn't that great as well, so that counts into it, but. No, let's see what happens next, man. We still got a whole bunch of time. For the first time this season in Spain, it was back to the bad luck for Kobayashi in Monaco, where his gearbox decided not to gearbox anymore. He finally scored points in Turkey, coming home in 10th place. But of course, when you're Komui Kobayashi, all good things must come to an end. And so in Canada, Turkey. he jumped over a curb and hit the wall. At the I had no idea that uh, F1 race in Turkey. This would be Turkey. the end of a horrendous start to the season, and things started to brighten up finishing 7th, 6th, 11th, 9th, and 8th in the next 5 rounds. That's not bad. It was business as usual in Italy though, and his gearbox exploded on lap 1, Ooh. as it had made quite the habit of doing this season. In Singapore, Kobayashi made it as far as lap 30 before trying a move on Schumacher which made the German give the wall a little bonk. And then, as a method of revenge, Shumi tried a stupid move on Kobayashi, <laughs> which hit him. At his first home race, Kamui brought it home instead. Shumi, girl. He off the season with an 8th in Korea, 10th in Brazil, and 14th in Abu Dhabi. Despite spending more time standing next to his car than sitting inside it, Kobayashi outscored De La Rosa with 32 points to Pedro's 6. Nick Heidfeld was brought in as Kobayashi's teammate for the last 4 rounds, but finished below him in 3 of them, and scored 5 fewer points. So, overall, this was a first year full of ups and downs, but to have dominated both teammates in the way that he did was a test testament to how good Kobayashi was in an F1 car. And even with his 8 DNFs, only one of them can truly be called his fault. Yeah. Which, for a first season, isn't bad at all. Yeah. Granted, Kobayashi did make a habit of crashing a bit in practice sessions, but even so, he was finding the limits in the times it didn't matter, not the times it did. 2011 was a much better season for the Japanese driver, and despite being disqualified from round 1 thanks to a technical infringement on Sauber's rear wings, and a couple of retirements in Italy and India, the season was pretty plain sailing. He scored in 9 of the 19 rounds, with a total of 30 points to his name. He again outscored his teammate, this time in Sergio Perez, Checo. by 16 points. In a recent interview, Sergio Perez said that Kobayashi was the fastest teammate he'd ever had in F1. Now, admittedly, that was said before he was... Is this before Verstappen? That has to be before Verstappen. But Kobayashi, yeah, he outperformed both of his teammates. Um, Kevin says that. Yeah, you know, the DNS, you want that to get cleaned up, but... Still, man, he... You know, so it's not too bad. Coupled with Max Verstappen, but even so, that puts Kobayashi ahead of Hulkenberg, Ocon, and even Jensen Button. And D Lance Jensen Stroll, but that was sort of obvious. Oh, in 2012, he kicked off the season with a joint career best so far of sixth. And then in round two, his brakes failed in typical Kobayashi form. After oh. two points finishes in China and Spain, oh, Kobayashi geez. was caught up in a first lap crash in the Monaco. But he Grand is Prix, like, he is involved in incidents a lot, though. No fault of his own. Kamui came back God, to the in Canada the following race, then Kobayashi crashed into Felipe Mazza during the oh. European Grand Prix, which got him a 5th place penalty for the next race. Oh, in shit. the German Grand Prix, Kamui came home in an amazing 4th place, and then towards the end of the season he bettered that by finishing on the podium in his home Grand Prix. Oh, yeah. The following race in Korea though was one to forget, with Kobayashi crashing into Jensen Button and Nico Rosberg on the first lap, and then 15 laps later his car couldn't take it anymore and he had to retire as well. Mm. The final 4 races of the season would end with a 14th in India, Sixth in Abu Dhabi, 14th in America, and 9th in Brazil. This season so, was the first in <laughs> Kobayashi's career where he was beaten by a teammate, although it was close. Ultimately, the Sauber car looked pretty inconsistent, and it was a rare occasion when one... Yeah, that's a high definition of inconsistent. You, you can just look at the, the retirements. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 so far. Driver would score point 10 points and the other not. 
So it's fair Just to say that Kobayashi and Perez were pretty evenly matched over the season, Very inconsistent. although Perez made less of a habit of crashing. After the end of the season, both drivers left the team, but yeah. while Perez was able to get a drive with McLaren, Kobayashi was less fortunate. So even though he could probably have got himself a seat with a lower team, thanks to the 8 million euros of sponsorship he'd raised, he elected to sit 2013 out. According to Wikipedia, he was focused on getting a competitive drive for the 2014 season, which went well. Now, in 2013, he did a bit of endurance racing, where he took 5th in the 24 hours of Le Mans and finished 7th in the FIA World Endurance Championship. But even so, this wasn't Formula 1. Yeah. I mean, neither was the car he'd be driving next year, but at least it looked like an F1 car. And the reason they say he didn't drive an F1 car in 2014 is simple. Because the Caterham was a car so slow, it would probably be beaten on a bad day by an F2 car. <laughs> Partnered up with Marcus Ericsson, Kobayashi struggled, with neither of the two being able to score a point. Oh, but with geez. Ericsson finishing higher in the standings thanks to a higher average finishing position, Later, bro. it was a really weird and inconsistent season overall, with Kobayashi being dropped for a single race in Belgium, where Andre Lotterer stepped in, out qualified Ericsson, retired on the first lap, and then left again. With the car <laughs> back at the hands of Kobayashi, he got a highest finish in the last seven rounds of 17th. And along with those lofty heights, there was a DNS and two DNFs. Oh, Kobayashi geez. was without a drive in the American and Brazilian uh, races because the team was sold earlier in the year without the transaction getting finalized. They therefore went into administration in Russia, which caused them to miss the following two races. Caterham and Kobayashi came back in Abu Dhabi, with Kamui's teammate for this one round being Will Stevens. Kobayashi oh, would retire is. from the race, and Stevens came last of the finishing cars. Oh, and that was the end of Kobayashi's F1 career. He'd gone from being the fastest teammate Paris had ever raced to finishing 22nd out of 22 drivers who completed more than one race. Now, this dismal season would not be his last in racing, but it was his last in F1. In 2015, he came 5th in the Super Formula Championship, then in 2016, he came 2nd at Le Mans and 3rd in WEC. He also finished 17th in Super Formula, but let's gloss over that one, yeah? He competed <laughs> in Super Formula, WEC, Super GT, the Intercontinental GT Challenge and the Blancpain GT Series in 2017, none of which he would take a race win in. He then went to Formula E for two races, that was pretty nice car. Points, and then in 2018, he came back to Super GT, Super Formula and Le Mans. He uh, again came second with his team in Le Mans, but other than that, there was nothing of note from that's his year. track, huh? His career sort of carried on like that. I'm not going to waste your time by reading out every single championship result, because to be completely honest, it would be faster and easier for you to go and do that yourself. But we can at least say that after leaving Formula 1, it was a pretty disappointing career for Kobayashi. I mean, he did also win the 24 Hours of Le Mans, but other than that, there weren't that many good results. Yeah. So, if we go back to the very start of his F1 career for a second, why was it that Toyota were prepared to sign a driver who'd finished 16th in GP2? Like, was there something that they saw and we don't, or was it just money? Well, Kobayashi made quite a bit of a habit of slagging off pay drivers, so you have to assume it was the former. But still, he came 16th. Usually people go into F1 from finishing 1st or 2nd in F2 or GP2, but Kobayashi was 16th. But I think I'm focusing on the wrong stuff here, because the fact is that Kobayashi was a good driver in F1. He was regarded as the overtake king, and he would always be the last to break when he was side by side with another driver. And although sometimes it didn't pay off for him, more often than not he would get past. This was the reason why, even though his qualifying wasn't a strong point, he would always get the better of his teammates in the race, even if he wasn't the fastest on track. Although his aggressive overtaking sometimes meant he'd hit the other driver, he always seemed to race with respect. Just scrolling through the Kobayashi fan channel I mentioned at the start of this video is enough to show you just how good Kobayashi was at racing. He could go down the inside, round the outside, he could switch back, undercut, you name a kind of overtake and Kobayashi could do it. I think the reason he struggled so much in the Caterham at the end of his career is because the car was so slow that he just couldn't get to anyone yeah. who could overtake. And the overtaking would be for 14. Hmm. And I'm saying all this as if overtaking was Kobayashi's only skill in F1, which is wrong. I know I'm milking this Paris thing now, but if you have someone who can outqualify Max Verstappen on pace, calling you the fastest teammate you've ever had, then you must be doing something right. right. But yeah, thank you for watching to the end of this video. If you're new around here and enjoyed it, now yeah, I mean it seemed like Kobayashi wasn't that bad. I mean if you guys to the Perez, like, like he said, telling you, you know he's one of the fastest drivers he's, he's had as a teammate, and then. You know, that's some that's some pretty good, you know, words to hear from, you know. But at the same time, you call the overtake king, which is hey, that's 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 a pretty, you know, cool cool nickname, overtake king. But at the same time, you know, you're still not finishing well. You still have a lot of DNFs. Uh but it seemed like outside F one he was okay. And like you said, I don't think he was a bad driver. Which to me, it's like he was. I think a lot of it was just in inconsistency. But along with that, his cars he was in just weren't that good. But in the first years in F1, I think he said uh, he outperformed both his teammates. Not until Perez showed up. But 
Kobayashi. Kamu Kobayashi. I mean, I, I would love to see him race, <laughs> but uh, hey, probably reason why he's not in F1. Anyway, so was he better than uh, Mahiver? I think, I think that's his name. Was he better? He, he, he had to be better than, than Mahiver. He's better than, he's better than uh, Latifi, so that's an already star right there. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like the video and sub as well. Talk to you guys later. Peace.